Oh, we'll do okay. that. Okay. Here we are. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, today, uh, we are pleased to have Susanna Yelin as a speaker of the seminar series of the Brazilian Physical Society in the area of atomic and molecular physics. Uh, Susanna Yelin is a currently a professor at Harvard University. She studied physics uh, at the University of Stuttgart, and then she moved uh, to the uh, Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, where she received uh, her PhD in uh, 1998. Since uh, 2002, she has been uh, a faculty at the University of Connecticut, first uh, as a, an assistant, then associate, and finally as a professor. Uh, she's also affiliated to the Institute for Theoretical Atomic, Molecular, and Optical Physics uh, at the Harvard Smithsonian uh, Center for Astrophysics, uh, or uh, ITAM. Uh, Suzanne uh, Yelin's research interests are uh, theoretical quantum optics and quantum information science. Uh, current research directions uh, in include a, a quantum control of ultra-cold polar molecules, investigation of novel coherence-based optical elements, uh, single photon or linear optics using the polar systems, coherent metamaterials and negative refractivity, and finally, a coherent control in condensed matter systems uh, and uh, uh, super radiance. Uh, she received uh, several honors and fellowships that I will not uh, uh, mention uh, in full. Among them, uh, since uh, 2017, she's, uh, uh, she's been a fellow of the American Physical Society. And also in 2013, she received the uh, Willis Lamb Award for Laser Science and Quantum Optics. And uh, uh, as an initiative uh, uh, recognition, also since 2018, she's an executive committee of the Harvard Quantum Initiative. The title of uh, today's colloquium is uh, Quantum Optics and Application. Uh, with cooperative uh, with cooperative to the arrays. Uh, YouTube attendees uh, can interact uh, with the speaker by asking questions via uh, chat that will be read by the uh, committee members. Please, uh, Susanna, you can uh, start. Okay, thank you so much, Tommaso. Um, well, um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to talk to all of you um, disembodied uh, people. Um, it would be even nicer to be in Natal um, I remember with great fondness um, um, my, my last visit there, which with COVID in between seems like um, half an eternity away, even though it's, I think, only like two, two, three, two three years. Anyway, so um, thank you so much for having me. And let me jump right in. I will start um, by, um, let's see, that works. So I will start by just briefly telling you some of the goals and some of the applications that we are going to, to see today. So um, pretty much everything what we do will happen in an array that looks something like that. Um, the array will be 2D, it will be ordered. Most of the time it's a square lattice, could be something else, but it's ordered. And these could be any type of radiators, dipoles. And I think for now, the easiest is to just imagine them as two level atoms. Um, so, and um, some of the things that we will use this for is to, to use it as a mirror to reflect light. And this reflects light actually frequency selective. And then I will show you an experiment um, where one can use an array like that for spatial light modulation, um, which is actually pretty classical up to this point. And to um, and a proposal to increase the cross section of the usual single atom cross section to a much bigger cross section, which is basically given by the size of the array, which is very much a, a quantum effect. And once one has this single um, kind of now impurity on the, on the array, um, one can, of course, also imagine kind of looking at two of them and see how they interact. Turns out that these, that these arrays potentially can also be used for metrology. And we are nowhere close to a good atomic clock yet or anything like that. But, but we have a couple of ideas how to do that. And I will tell you one of them. Um, one can do some topology with that. However, I'm sorry that I even have this in because I'm not going to talk about that, but I will talk about 
the quantum mirror where you basically have um, superpositions in principle about uh, of mirrors and images and, and mirror images that that could be in principle consist of different states. Um, then we want to manipulate dark state. Um, of course, this picture is a little silly because the, the state is not dark, only the person, our state is dark. And finally, we are of course also like everybody else looking for new quantum states of matter. And finally, in particular, we want to look into, to use that into, to use quantum class. So I don't know how easy this is. Um, as you can see, I will actually start with with giving you an introduction about the basic physics of that, it will be very short. Um, and then I will go through a couple of applications. And um, it really makes a lot of sense if you have questions regarding the, the various applications to, to interrupt me. This might technologically not be so easy. So in that case, I will just keep talking until my time is out. Um, but I'm perfectly happy to be interrupted. Okay, so. Um, here, why so-called cooperative effects? And first of all, I want to say what I even mean by cooperative effects. So um, this goes actually back to Robert Dicke um, more than 16, actually ne nearly 70 years ago. Um, and Dicke invented superradiance. And he was apparently, as one can see out of the quote of his um, original paper, was a little bit at the loss of how to call this new phenomenon that he just kind of found. So what he says is, for want of a better term, a gas which is radiating strongly because of coherence will be called superradiant. So I am not really going to talk about superradiance, but I'm talking about the cooperative effects, which is really the physics behind superradiance. And so I, what I will do to start with, I will actually tell you very briefly and in very, very simple terms what, what um, superradiance is. And I hope that this kind of goes at least a long ways toward kind of uh, giving you an idea what, what cooperativity is about. Okay. So let's take a step back and let's look at the single atom. And we are looking only at two, at two of the states of the, of the two atoms, uh, which I kind of denoted here. And right now we start with the electron and the upper state. And of course, eventually this will spontaneously emit uh, or spontaneously decay into the lower state and emit a photon while doing so. And if you do that with a single atom in vacuum and just wait around, um, um, how long this takes and you do it again and you do it again and you do it again and then do you average over um, at what time, what intensity of photon you see, you see this typical kind of stochastic um, exponential curve um, um, it, as, as if you look at the intensity in time. So if you now take two atoms instead, which are however pretty far away so that they really don't see each other, um, you get the same thing. You um, 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 you let you let them decay. Photons come out. They come, of course, out in completely arbitrary directions and at arbitrary time. And you look at the at the intensity that you would expect to come out. Um, it gives exactly the same kind of exponential curve here. Um, and um, since I have the intensity per atom, it's also the same height. So. Um, now we take two atoms, which however are very close together. And this very close, I mean close as compared to a wavelength of this decay. Um, in this case, what happens is that when one of them decays, it a little bit stimulates the next two to decay. So it basically gives the next a kick so that the next one is more likely to decay very, very soon or, or more or less at the same time as the first one. And the photons will come out both in the same direction and the same phase. That's not necessarily like that. It's just a little bit more likely. And as a consequence, we have a little bit of a change in this curve. So these atoms, they, they, they see each other. The first decay is, um, of the first atom is always spontaneous, but there's a dipole-dipole interaction between these two. And so they actually see each other. And as a result, this intensity per atom changes a little bit. 
Now we do this much stronger. We take a lot. Here there are only 10. Um, and all of them are initially excited and we all of them let them decay and we get basically effectively stimulated emission for all but the first one. And what you see here is that first of all, this light tends to come out all in phase and we get this initial huge intensity before it falls off. And of course, um, um, as you know, if, if we add up this amplitude of the light, the intensity actually um, gives, the, gives the square because the intensity is the square of the amplitude. So if we have n times the amplitude, where n is the number of atoms, we get n squared times the, the um, intensity. And this is why, and this is of course only for a short time because the total energy that we get um, per atom is of course the same as before. So we get this short, really strong peak, then it falls off and this peak, the height, the total height of the peak goes with n squared. And this is due to constructive interference. The in constructive interference is because the atoms see each other and the atoms see each other because there's a dipole dipole inter interaction. And usually that is called the build up of collective dipoles. And I put this in quotes because if you ever kind of do quantum optics, you see the dipole matrix element is this kind of non-diagonal single atom matrix element rho eg, um, which is actually not what this collective dipole is about. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. Doesn't matter. I just wanted to mention that at the site. Um, if I would give a talk about supervariance, I would now go in depth into this term. But um, since I'm not, I will leave it with that. So this dipole-dipole interaction and the resulting coherent effects is what plays a role in every single application and every single kind of um, physical system that I'm going to show you here. So this is, um, please do keep this in mind because when I talk about the applications, this part tends to get lost. All right, so here we have, we have again our 2D array. Here I show it from the side. And what the, the first thing that we actually want to do with that is that we want an array that has a very strong optical response, um, especially if we send only a single photon or something on the single photon level in. Um, this response ideally should be engineerable so that we can manipulate, manipulate what we do. And one of the things that we can do is that one can actually create guided modes. And with that, one can show this topological phenomena, which I'm not going to talk about. So you can, um, you can assume that, this, um, that this, this array that we are also going to, of course, change around a little bit. Um, can be seen as atomic matter surfaces um, in a similar way how you can how you can kind of manipulate the, the nanoparticles in classical matter, matter surfaces. So the first thing that I would like to explain here is um, what happens if we send some light here in the perpendicular direction of this array, which one is now kind of basically seeing from above. So um, here is our array and let's just assume again, this is two level atoms. And what I've done here is I've plotted uh, roughly the, the this um, cross section of all the atoms. If we assume that the lattice constant um, of this array here and the and the wave the wave lengths of the of the decay um, decaying radiation are of the same order. So you might remember um, from any of your um, whatever quantum physics class or something like that that the cross section for resonant light is of the order of lambda squared. So what I've really plotted here are all the cross sections of all of the atoms. Um, if, if we have um, this, this size. So now, if we send a light in, um, it would be relatively likely that it hits a cross section and just something happens with it. So despite the fact that compared to a real mirror, this is really a, still a very dilute system. 
um, we could expect that, that, that we don't get a lot of transmission here. And as it turns out, we actually can get complete reflection from a mirror like that. Um, but this complete reflection happens only for certain ratios between the lattice constant, so the distance between the atoms and the wavelengths. And this happens to be exactly 0 0.2 and 0 0.8. And so what one gets is a picture, as I showed before, that we send light of a certain wavelength and everything gets reflected. Please do note that obviously in this picture here, not everything gets reflected. Um, in order to make a nice picture, we kind of detuned this a little bit, um, but, but basically the, the, the idea is like this. So here I would like to, um, to first give necessary credit and also tell a little kind of uh, story. Um, what happens if you do some interesting research, which is kind of either cutting edge or in some other way really falls into the realm of things that people at the moment are very interested in. You find something, you get very excited about that, say, let's publish this, let's put that on the archive. Um, but of course, when you put something on the archive, you have to check whether anybody else has ever done something similar. And what ha happens in these cases more often than not, is you look on the archive and you find, like we did here, a paper that was put on the archive two weeks earlier, two days earlier, two months earlier. And I was, in our case, I think it was about two weeks earlier. And they really, they had kind of done some numerical calculations and have found exactly, they, they didn't use a, a square lattice, I think they used a triangular lattice, but they found exactly that. They found it's complete reflection for certain numerical factors um, which depend on A over lambda. So what do you do in such a case, right? You can either say, oh damn, um, we have been scooped, let's do something else. Or you, tr you say, hmm, um, obviously this is a very interesting topic. Other people work on that as well. And um, let's see what they have done. And then do more and do better and do more interesting and, and kind of connect up with these people and see whether we can kind of come up with, with more together. And we did all this. And um, so please do read their paper. You can see this, is, this has been, uh, this appeared about a year before ours because we put a lot more work in that. But what we, among other things, found is actually an explanation why this happens. And that was not in this first paper. So this was my little aside. So um, what we did when we found this um, is that we first of all, um, we figured hmm, we need to understand the physics of that. And second, we have to figure why this cooperativity, um, namely the fact that these atoms interact coherently actually matters. And I will give you a very, very brief rundown of what happens here. This is about as complicated as mathematics gets in this talk today. Um, so what we assume here is that we have an input-output formalism. So this is the field that comes out. And we assume that this propagation direction is, um, which now goes basically into the screen, is the Z direction. Um, and we assume that our array is infinitely big and completely symmetric and completely ideal. So this outgoing field um, is given by the incoming field, which is just, you just assume to be a, a plane wave in the Z direction and a scattered wave, which for symmetry reason now can only scatter it um, in, um, either in the plus or in the minus Z direction. And this comes with a scattering constant S and if you look closely at this, then you find that if S is minus one, then the forward direction actually um, vanishes and we have only a backward direction. And backward direction, of course, means perfect reflection. And that's exactly what we are looking for. So the problem has just been simplified of generally understanding the physics of when do we get reflection to just calculating the scattering constant here and looking when this is minus one. So this is something, this is relatively straightforward and the, the solution looks like that. Um, in case you, you work a lot with, with scattering and especially single particle scattering, you will recognize the 
the Lorentzian form here where we have some gamma um, in the numerator and the delta plus I gamma in the, in the denominator. Um, and the only difference is that both the, the, the gamma and the delta have a term gamma collective and delta collective in it. And this gamma and delta collective actually just is a number delta minus I over two gamma is a, is a complex number that comes if you add up all the dipolar interaction of every atom with every atom, other atom in this, in this array. And you can actually do an infinite sum here theoretically if you assume an ideal array and can calculate both this delta and this gamma terms. And if you now look back at the form of this S, um, you find um, that S is exactly minus one if this del the total delta term is equal to zero. So that should be very easy. So that means the only thing that we actually, this delta, sorry, I should say this, this delta is the detuning between the incoming field and the resonance of the atoms. And to start with, we just set this zero. So this means the only thing that we have to find is the, is the functional dependence of this collective kind of real part of the collective interaction. And that's exactly what we have done here. This needs to be calculated um, numerically, as I say, as an infinite sum. But what comes out is that we get a value of this, um, which has a maximum and goes diverges both for infinitely kind of close atoms, which is not so surprising because if you put these atoms infinitely close and they have a dipole-dipole interaction, of course the dipole-dipole interaction gets infinity. And so, um, and so this, this shift that you get from this delta gets infinitely big, no surprise here it actually also diverges at the place where the lambda is the same as A. And this is actually a well-known resonance and I'm not going deeper into the physics, but it goes up here, has a maximum and gets down here. And now we can just draw the line where this is zero. And we find uh, as we expected that this gives exactly A over lambda of 0.2 and of 0 0.8, which is exactly the kind of numbers that we found when we first did this whole thing numerically. The nice thing is that now we know we can also put this outside the detuning. So the detuning between the incoming light and the resonance other than zero. So that means we can kind of shift this up and down. This is what these other colored lines are. So we have, we have the tuning um, of, of um, it actually here we have the red direction is up, the blue direction is down. So, so we can red detune it a little bit or blue detuning a little bit or a lot and get all these different kind of uh, reflection coefficients. So the yellow one is the original one, which is fully reflective of 0 0.8 and 0 0.2. And as you see, in principle, we can choose our detuning such that we can get pretty much any um, um, fully reflective um, array anywhere between A over lambda between zero and one. So that is the idea of the collective mirror. And um, before I go on, there's actually in these arrays, there are two things. This one is only the mirror thing, which is the first thing that we found um, and which perhaps was the most surprising. And there's a second element. And I will talk about the second element in a second. But before I want to do that, I want to just show that this works for any kind of regular lattice that you can think of. Uh, the spare lattice is what I just shown. Um, there's the triangular lattice, <coughs> excuse me, that's the one that was in this Battles Adams paper that I showed and um, they used it for that. They get similar um, um, values, but their values are not 0 0.2 and 0 0.8, but 0 0.18 something and 0 0.8 something. So it's a little bit different. Um, you can also use a Kagome lattice or a, a hexagonal or, or honeycomb lattice. The honeycomb lattice is in particularly interesting because it's, it looks like graphene and has so-called Dirac points. So if you ever want to do type um, topology, that would be the right lattice for you to use. Um, this is just, again, just an aside in case you're interested in something like that. So the second element in this is the band structure. So here is the, the band structure of the system. Um, here again, we go back to the, to the square lattice for simplicity. 
um, which has these, these three major symmetry points. The one is, is in the middle, um, which is the, 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 the gamma point. And then we have the X as, as the symmetry point between two points and the, uh, between two corners and the endpoint on the corner. And, and there you see this, um, this dotted line, which is the same dotted line that we see here in the band diagram. Please do note that the three different solutions, um, blue, yet red, and yellow, um, are the three different polarization that the light can have. And if we go to circular polarized light, we get this dotted uh, 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 broken purple line. But as you can see, they are all at least qualitatively somewhat similar. So um, what is the difference between what is in the inside of this dotted line and the outside of the dotted line? That's actually where the interesting physics comes in. So if we are relatively, please do note that, of course, what I have plotted here is also the Brillouin zone. So if I have, if I'm with my Brillouin zone and um, with my K values, somehow within this circle here, that means that the K in the, in the uh, X Z direction is equal or smaller to the K that, that comes in from the, from, the, from the free space. And um, therefore we can have K X squared, K Y squared is equal or smaller to the total K squared and therefore can easily connect to free space. And so if we have K values that are here light can couple into and out of the array. The much more interesting part is if we are outside here. So that's when we are somewhere outside of in, in the Brillouin zone outside of the circle. In this case, the K value is too big. And um, the, 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 um, so the total K squared on the surface is bigger than the K squared out in the vacuum and it's energetically not allowed to couple. And so if we have any of those modes excited, um, the, the excitation will live on forever and ever and ever on the surface and will never kind of emit off the surface. Um, there's of course, that's of course not true because for that you need an ideal system, but at least to the zeros order, this is true. And of course, at the end, what you want to do is combine the inside the light cone and outside the line cone to, to manipulate um, what, what one does with the light. And that's really the, the, the whole trick of this. So again, the physics of this is A, the fact that we have this, this frequency selective reflection and B, that we have this wave guiding. And a priori, they don't have anything to do with each other, but of course you can kind of plug and play now and see what you can do with this. And this is basically what the second half of my talk will be about. First, I would like to talk to about the most important implementation. So in what kind of um, experimental systems can one even have this? The obvious is the so-called quantum gas microscope, um, which um, was first done in Markus Kreiner's lab, um, which, they, which is in the meantime exists all over the world, where this kind of two-dimensional array is really kind of caught in a trap directly under a very high aperture optical microscope, and which allows you to kind of actually really image every atom by itself. And it's typically a, a, a uh, square array. And this is, of course, an ideal system. And it turns out that Marcus just very recently kind of changed his array such that one can actually change the lattice constant. So now we are actually talking about how best to, to do experiments with that. I should say that there was an earlier experiment which showed a lot of what we have done, which was done in, in Emmanuel Bloch's group um, already kind of early last year. Um, so um, that's the one where we just really have atoms, basically the way how we talked about. But it would, of course, this is a very difficult experiment. So it would be very nice if it would be possible to actually put something like that in something that exists already or it, that we make once and then it's there. So um, any kind of 2D solid state material, ideally semiconductor would be nice. And fortunately, something like this exists. Um, these are these so-called um, transition metal dichalcogenides. Um, 
which are, um, if you look from above, look pretty much like graphene. So we really have this honeycomb lattice where the black ones would be a transition metal like molybdenum or tungsten. And these yellow ones, they are actually doubled up. Um, as they, so each yellow one is a, is a pair of, of um, dichalcogenides like sulfur or selenite. And these are fantastic materials. First of all, they are a priori already 2D, so you don't have to work very much. It's basically like graphene. You can, you can kind of, if you have a system like that, you can, um, you can put a, a, a piece of scotch tape on it and just get the single layer off. Um, um, it's, it's like graphene, it's a honeycomb. So it has Dirac points, if you ever want to do something with Dirac points. Um, but other than graphene, it actually has excitons. So graphene has basically no excitons. You can do electrons, but not excitons. But we want to couple to light, so we want excitons. And these have very good excitons. In fact, not just excitons, but excellent excitons. And there is quite a lot of people who make experiments with those things. And two of them are my colleagues, Hong Kun Park and Philip Kim here at Harvard. And the first experiment that they did um, with when, when, they, when they managed to have this nice kind of single layer sheet of this was to actually do this experiment where they, where they look at the reflection. And this is what you see in this picture. If you look at, at this with normal kind of, I think this is normal visible light. Um, and this is on an HBN um, um, surface and has some platinum leads close to it. And um, it is drawn in by hand where this where the single layer thing is, because as you can see, you don't you don't see anything, right? You don't see where this thing is. If you, however, change your right wavelength just right, you see that this that this um, that this um, um, mostly um, kind of single layer here um, becomes visible, and this is. Um, pretty much exactly the effect that I showed you before. There are some, some special kind of things about, about um, excitons where this is a bit different. I don't want to go into de detail. Um, this was actually published at uh, just at a very similar time than the paper that, that I showed before. And it was published pretty much very similar results back to back, both by here, the, 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 the experimental groups here at Howard and Atachi Mamoglu's group in Zurich. So. And um, there's a lot what I could tell you about that, but I want to go a little bit into applications and my clock here says I'm exactly 30 minutes in. So I will now talk a little bit about applications and I will start um, with just listing a couple of them. So the first one is this perfect mirror that I showed you about. And this is of course kind of only a, a kind of a toy model. I mean, if we want the mirror, we want something um, not necessarily where we see ourselves, but at least something which we can, for example, use for a laser cavity or something like that. And laser cavities, there exist actually pretty good ones. What does not exist are good laser cavities for things like X-ray or UV light. And the hope is that we can somehow find radiators um, where we can build something like that with the right kind of length scale, et cetera, that we can build um, um, built um, mirrors for, for wavelengths where this is not easy with, with um, traditional means. And this is one of the things we look into, but I'm not going into details because our results are not quite there yet. Um, obviously, one can make 1D or 2D waveguides. The waveguide I explained to you before that actually turns out happens also in 1D. Um, so the first one that I will show you is how one can potentially use that as a spatial light modulator. So as I mentioned before, this starts with a completely classical or just kind of um, um, electromagnetic wave kind of type physics. So here we look at the array from the side, right? So this is still 2D, but it's, it's, the, the array is into the plane. And these are our scatterers. And then we come in with incoming photons and at a bit of an angle. And they, of course, they get reflected. Um, um, at basically the same angle, um, they come in. And um, 
there is a direction where this works best, which is exactly the one where these blue reflected photons um, interfere coherently, right? This is the so-called Bragg reflection. Um, and so if you come in with light from different direction, you will see certain, certain directions very bright and other directions not at all. So um, what happens if we now take the right half of the atoms? Oh, sorry, that's what I just said. If we take the right half of the atoms and change them a little bit, such that, they ref that the reflection is somewhat phase changed compared to the original ones. In this case, our Bragg direction, the really good direction changes a little bit. And one can um, um, plot this with a little bit more detail. So um, what one basically gets if one, so what, what one has here, one has here this, this transition metal dichalcogenide. So this is this 2D semiconductor that I talked to you, to you about. Um, and put a, an electrode on top of the whole thing of it and an electron on top of only half of it. So this, X, this half electrode makes sure that the phase of what gets reflected from the left side is different from the phase that gets reflected from the left side. And so basically what happens is that they that the right side gives this kind of red interference pattern and the left side gets, gets the blue one. And as you can see, there is one direction where we get constructive interference. And that's exactly the one where one can see this. And if we now change this phase, we will change this direction around. And that's exactly what one does with this, with this lower, um, lower electron here. And um, this is how this, the microscopic picture looks like of, of, this, of this transition between with, with only one electron and with two electrodes. Perhaps it's the other way around, I don't remember anymore. So um, the nice thing about this is that it's pretty simple physics that everybody knows and that switching these electrodes because you only need very, very little um, um, voltage here is extremely, extremely fast. So it's on a nanosecond scale, which is faster than any other light steering that people can do so far. So there's one piece of the puzzle I need to tell you. This is basically not this kind of very artistic big picture here, but the small one of this exciton. So how do we actually change the phase? This is basically just by changing the, the, the total transition frequency a little bit. This is, of course, way, way exaggerated here. Um, by, by changing this voltage that we have on here, we change the, the transition frequency of the exciton. And by that, we change the phase. That's basically how this is done. And here is just an artistic, again, picture of, of the, the more the, the excited, non-excited, and more kind of higher excited, lower excited exciton here. And how we put, you put this together nicely you can get some kind of picture. So you, of course, don't get a picture like that because so far we can do the beam steering only in one dimension. But um, the, the second dimension is very easy by instead of having two different phases, making sure that we have three different phases. So we have basically, um, this is a little bit tricky kind of how this is done experimentally, but it's basically, you can assume that we have the same as before, but just a different electrode and on the third, on the third part. And this one, now you can st steer in both direction, depending on how, how these relative phase angles between these different um, three different points are. And to show that one can really do that experimentally, this is what they did in the lab. Um, they just spelled out, um, spelled out physics um, with, with this. And, and what you see on the X and Y axis are, um, are angles. Um, in the X and Y direction. And as I say, so far, this is mostly classical physics, but of course, since this is the same type of array um, that, that I showed you before, now one, and the hope is of course that we can like, for example, get the superposition of a P and an H and a Y and an S, et cetera. So that would be basically the next step. So this is, um, um, done mostly in Misha's, Misha Lukin's group. This is uh, Trond Andersen's work, um, which is 
uh, I think appearing some of these days on the on the archive. Um, this um, it's submitted and hopefully soon on the archive. Okay, so that was one application. Um, let's see what else we can do. So I said this topological, which I don't want to talk about. The next thing would be a highly sensitive optomechanical system. Um, the optomechanical is the is the, if you have a mirror and the light field um, interacting with each other and and um, having um, reaction and back reaction on each other. Um, we have a lot of physics on this. Um, um, more than I would what I would want to talk about today, but this is actually also um, the work of my former postdoc, who is now a professor at Weizmann Institute, and he kind of um, that's what he usually talks about. So I don't want to do that too. So um, this basically both have been done, and um, is is um, I'm not going to talk about this today. So the next is what I call quantum antenna and co coherent interaction for impurities. That's basically what I hinted at before, and this is what I will briefly talk about. So um, again, a single atom in space vacuum all by itself has a cross section with a single photon, which is of the size of lambda squared. So if you send um, a photon in here, a single photon, the, the, the probability that the single photon interacts with the single atom is vanishingly small, unless you build a really, 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 really excellent tiny cavity and it's very hard. And even then it's not perfect, okay? So what if we could set this one single atom as an impurity into the array that we look at? Can we make it such that the cross section basically gets all as big as the array? And if we make the array really huge, the cross section gets really huge. Huge. So this is something where um, where you have to play around a bit. Here we definitely need the wave guiding. We also need this reflectivity stuff. Um, but I um, um, use your intuition or your imagination how that that works. This is work that. Um, been shown mostly numerically, and I will sh show you a couple of pictures for that. So if you have a single atom, or a, here it's called impurity, but it's an impurity alone in space, so it's just a single atom, this would be the scattering profile. Um, and this is what it's also, which, which, give, which gives the gauge for the, for the other ones. So two um, would be basically just the, the, the near field kind of scattering. And one is basically the normal scattering that you get as forward scattering. So that's the normal maximum unless you are in the near field. You can do a similar calculation for the array only, no impurity. Then you get exactly this. You come in from here and you get this back reflected, get the standing wave. That's exactly what we saw before, just from a different angle, right? And um, please do note if we use the same kind of intensity scale, this one goes up to four because we get um, constructive interaction here. Uh, sorry, constructive, constructive interference. So what happens if we put both of these together? And this is what happens. So we have this impurity here in the middle and it looks already on the first glance much brighter, but please do note that also we had to kind of rescale quite dramatically in order to even see anything here, because this, this scattering cross section is enormous suddenly. And it's actually, this is already partially in the far field. If we go really into the near field, we get another a couple of extra um, orders of magnitude here. So this works really extremely well. How does this work? How is the physics of that? We are basically going with the with the frequency of the of the impurity just beyond the light that that can settle in on the array. So that means that if light impinges on the array, um, due to this dipole dipole interaction all over the array, it will just kind of run around on the array and see what it could do. Um, and it can't do nothing, so it would kind of go off to the side somewhere, but it hits eventually this impurity. And it actually is such that it's, um, that it's still within the kind of um, um, resonance window of the impurity, and so it, it will stick to the impurity. And what one has is really basically an array collecting all the, the intensity that comes in and putting them all on the single impurity. That's what happens, okay? 
Now, of course, if we have two um, that that both are basically in at the at the same frequency, what we would expect is that one of them ex is excited. Um, if that kind of gets de-excited, that most of the that most of the excitation would go in the other in the other way around. So we would expect them to talk to each other, and in the very simplest case, exchange population coherently. So how can one measure this? Um, for this, we define a quality factor, and this quality factor is basically how does the coupling strength between the two impurities compare to decay into space, okay? And the first picture that one can make here is that we just look, we start with the impurity one excited and just let it go, just do nothing. And what happens is that the, the impurity one gets de-excited um, while the, the impurity two gets excited and then it goes the other way around. And so it goes back and forth, basically similar to a Rabi, um, Rabi oscillations. As you can see, it's not all that perfect after whatever, let's say of the order of, of 20 or 30 oscillations, we are basically already down to one over E. Um, but we can see how well that works and look actually at this quality factor that I have um, shown up here and where the color here is yellow. And I'm sorry here, I've, um, I've forgotten the y-axis. The y-axis is our old friend, the A over lambda ratio. And here is the detuning between the lattice and the impurity atoms. And as you can see, exactly here at the border is where it works very well. And then there are other regions, these blue regions where the quality factor now is 10 to the minus four. So if we are in the parameter region here, the opposite happens. The stuff which is on the, on the impurity will, will, will decay four times faster than it would in vacuum. Okay, and here we can um, look at a couple of different parameters. Here we changed a couple of things, and I don't even want to say what all. And um, here you see that these oscillations are perfect, at least on the first glance, right? They don't decay at all. And if you look at the most yellow kind of parameter region, you see that the quality factor here has actually gone up to 10 to the 6. So that's exactly what we would expect. And um, this kind of really, really low quality, however, still exists. So we can really kind of, depending on how we do this detuning and the A over lambda, we can really kind of very much manipulate what our impurity here does. And um, I have another picture, which I actually don't want to go into. So um, I just want to show you that or tell you that one of course now can use that in order to build an on array quantum computer. And there are basically A, this so-called single atom nonlinearity, um, um, where the impurities are single atoms that are basically what I showed you before. And for that, you would find the transmission, et cetera. I'm not going into that. The second part is what I'm really interested in. Namely, now we can have on array networks of impurity atoms or impurity qubits. And as, an, as a difference to what we did before, um, we, um, um, we would have to be able to switch off and on whether, whether the impurity actually accepts an excitation or not, which can be pretty easily done three level atom. And this is basically this. And with that one can make single and two qubit gates. Um, for that one needs electromagnetically induced transparency. This is something which we have done and it works, but it's not published yet. And so I, and this is also something I don't want to really talk about yet. All right. so. Um, I probably will talk only about one and a half more things and go over the over the rest. So this kind of metrology part, I think I will just skip and we'll go forward um, to the next topic, um, which is um, what we call lattice momentum dark states and where we can do photon storage. Um, the reason I want to do that is um, because these are relatively new results and everything which I showed you so far is all already at least a couple of months old. So this one is just kind of, I think, was put on the archive something like last week. And I think I don't even cite it yet because um, I forgot to put it on. All right. So um, the, this, this part is, I will briefly define what I mean by lattice dark states. And, and whether they can be used to store photons, which is, of course, the idea of those, and whether we can do something else with them than just storage. 
So, what do we do here? Um, so far, we are a little bit um, dependent on, on the, the um, question of luck, on whether any given photon actually fits in and whether it's within the light cone or without the light cone. And if it's in the light cone, then we cannot put it outside the light cone. If it's outside the light cone, we cannot put it within the light cone. So kind of combining the two so far hasn't happened. So now I basically show you one of the methods on how you can do this. So what we have done here is we have still the same lattice as before, but we now have two qualitatively different um, types of atoms. And um, I show you what the difference is of the two, namely, um, if they are excited, they have a slightly different frequency and we can put that by, for example, putting a super lattice on or something like that. And we will kind of gauge our, our energy such that the blue ones are detuned by minus delta and the red ones are detuned by plus delta. What does this mean? If we now look back at our, um, at our Brion ensemble picture with the gamma X and M um, symmetry states, then we go from when, when all of, all of the, the atoms are the same, um, to this kind of checkerboard pattern means that we go from gamma towards M in momentum space. And this is the on lattice momentum. So this, even if you might not see it immediately, is actually effectively now a three level system. The first, the lowest level is just every atom in the ground state. So there is no such pattern and nothing. The second is where we, where we send in a field, which on the average has one photon. So we get one excitation on the lattice, but we don't have the super lattice on. So the Delta that you see here is zero and still all the atoms are the same. And then we can turn up this detuning so that one can see the difference between blue and red. And that's basically the coupling to a third level. And it turns out that in momentum space, this kind of checkerboard pattern would be exactly um, k plus pi, where pi is both a pi, um, a, a pi step in the x and in the y directions here. And of course, um, and here I'm sorry, I, I'm just making assumption that you know everything, but I'm sure you do know everything. This three level atom effectively is a lambda system. So if you look a little bit from the side here, this one looks like a lambda and it's coherent. And therefore, you can do all the physics that you can do with a lambda system. For example, create a dark state, namely a superposition only of this state and this state where this middle state is not involved. And if you can, can create this dark state, you can do things like stir up between that, which is stimulated Raman adiabatic passage, which is a very well known effect where you can very coherently and very deliberately move population between these two legs of the lambda, namely here, the G and the K plus pi state. And this has been shown before um, that you can use that in order to store a single photon. And I won't go into any details. Um, this, um, you need certain kind of time uh, timeline of your pulse, et cetera. We have all optimized that, that works just nicely. And the first question is, of course, can we store and, and retrieve photons with very high efficiency? Answer, of course, is yes. Otherwise I will show that. And the retrieval, we try to be a little bit more realistic than the totally um, ideal case and assume that our light fields neither are completely plain waves nor are point-like, but we take light fields with a Gaussian waves. Gaussian waves. And the question is now with what efficiency can we retrieve an excitation? And of course, what we want to get to is about 100%. So, Turns out that we cannot quite get to 100%, but pretty close. So here we have one minus the quality that we can do, um, um, which we hope to be a very small number. And this is actually plotted here logarithmically. And as you can see, for a 15 by 15 array, we can get a little bit better than 99.9%. .9%. For a 21 by 21 array, we actually we can nearly get to 99.99% fidelity. Okay. And as you can see, this also has an x axis. And it turns out that the Gaussian waste is actually 
ideal not at zero, but if you make it somewhat finite. So if you don't go over the whole array, but if you include at least a couple of, of atoms, which is not so surprising um, um, because, um, because of course we want a couple of atoms involved for this cooperativity to happen, okay? So there's always an optimum. Um, if, we, if, we, if we store and retrieve it right away, this is the quality that we get. If we store, wait 50 lifetimes and retrieve it then, it gets a little worse. It gets only to a little bit worse than 99%, which is actually still pretty good. Okay, so, and with that, I don't even want to go deeper into that. Just make a little list. So first of all, ah, no, sorry, I forgot one thing. So now, of course, instead of um, going only in one other um, momentum state, we can go into two momentum states, namely, for example, store in, let's say this momentum state where we have stripes instead of the checkerboard pattern and retrieve um, with the stripes in the opposite direction. In this case, we, with the storage, go from the gamma to the X point and with the retrieval from the X to the M point. And what we get at the end, we get actually oscillations between, um, between this mode and this mode. And this might look, for example, something like this. Please do note that both the quality of these oscillations and the time scale on which this oscillation happens depend on how large this detuning is. So this is a little bit unreasonably small detuning. This is a little bit unreasonably large detuning. So the, the best, the easiest experimentally will lie somewhere in between. And of course, if we can do two different ones, we can in principle three different by, by, by retrieving on two modes at the same time, and then we might get three modes and so on. And of course, at the end, the hope is that we can, with something like perhaps 10 modes or so, get an arbitrary radiation or mode pattern that gives an arbitrary um, um, radiation pattern with which we then can again make kind of really pretty pictures or something like that. We haven't done this yet. I think for that, a little bit of optimization, et cetera. For example, machine learning would be needed. Okay, so with that, I will... Um, not quite stop, but I will stop with this one and I will just show you this kind of um, um, quantum um, uh, quantum matter surfaces that I was talking about before. So um, here um, we have the same array back that we had before, but now we create a superposition state of those. So the superposition might be, for example, of an array where all the atoms are in the ground state and an array where all the atoms are in the, in the excited state. Okay, so um, we don't know yet whether this can, actually can be done, but let's just assume this can be done. What happens if we are in a superposition state like that? It's basically a cat state. Um, and send some light in and look at the refraction. Um, as before. Um, if we are in the in the yellow case, um, sorry, if we are in the blue case, this is exactly the case from before, we get the reflection as we have seen before. But if we are in the yellow case, um, this because we are in the excited state already, this reflection doesn't happen. So it just gets transmitted. So if we have a superposition between both, that means we have now created a medium where we have superposition between reflection and, super, and, and transmission. So that means we have effectively a superposition um, of the atomic response and uh, of the mirror response. And this is basically what in a little bit kind of a more fancy um, 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 setup this, this kind of picture is, which I stole from the internet and which I showed you before. And in the very last two minutes, I will show you how you can actually relatively cre easily create such a superposition state, okay? So here, we also again go through three level atoms. So our three level atoms have a ground and an excited state as before. Um, where we sent in an, a, a photon now with a, with a frequency omega, um, and the frequency omega might be exactly in resonant or somewhat kind of off resonant here. 
And then in addition, as a third state, we have a Rydberg state. So Rydberg states are very highly excited um, and have a very, very strong interaction, which can be made such that basically even the furthest away atoms in such an array are, are interacting with each other. And this is coupled by, um, by an, an, another field, which is basically either on all the time or off all the time. So what happens if we have such a situation? We get also again um, EIT or electromagnetically induced transparency, which I mentioned before. What is EIT? EIT means if we are um, between the extreme cases here on two photon resonance, the absorption between G and E and actually between E and R vanishes. So if there is no absorption here, it is like if this middle level here is not even there, right? As if we have only G and O. And then of course, this light that we send in here will not reflect, this will just go through, okay? If however, we have a situation where this two photon resonance, namely that these two, two kind of fields together have, are not resonant with the GR transition, um, if that's not the case, then this middle level is seen again and we get reflection. And this is exactly the case if we push this upper level out of resonance and this upper level, as I told you, we, that's in a Rydberg state and this rydberg rydberg interactions are so strong that they change this, this frequency here. So if we have a very strong rydberg rydberg interaction, this thing will be out of resonance and therefore this upper level will be visible again. And then we have actually this, um, this reflection. So that means that we don't have to make a superposition a priori, a superposition of all the atoms and all the atoms, but we just need to find a superposition of one atom somewhere in here or somewhere out of here and make a superposition of that one um, either in the, between the ground state and the Rydberg state. And this one atom basically um, effectively looks like that. It has an, in, an, an, an interaction radius, which is larger than the whole array. And so um, in this case, we, with, with making a superposition state of one single atom, we get effectively a superposition state um, of the whole array. And that one we can use to get this kind of superposition of answers. And with that, you can actually now make some pretty kind of um, um, quantum information, which I'm not going over in, in any more detail. And so here, um, this last topic, I will actually not talk about. So um, I will just, what is of course super, super important, show you um, the people who actually did the work here before I finish. Um, so on the top row are the, the respective leaders. Um, Effie is this postdoc I talked about, who is at Weizmann now. Um, Taylor and Oriol, um, both are my students. Um, Stefan, Valentin, Rivka, um, either are or, or were postdocs. And there are a lot of other people who come in and a lot of people who um, nicely gave us some money. And um, with that, I would like to just thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, okay, great. Thanks a lot for the beautiful talk. You spoke about very many things, so I hope that our audience uh, didn't get lost <laughs> in the, the presentation because you really presented a, a series of results. Everybody, uh, everybody gets lost in, in, in so many topics. That's, that's normal. <laughs> um, hopefully not from slide one though. <laughs> So guys, I will ask you, of course, to put your questions in the chat, but let me let me start maybe Suzanne, because uh, uh, I had a technical curiosity, but yep. one of the very first things that you were talking about, uh, which was uh, that um, condition on the S parameter, which I think yes. was yes, the yes, scattering yes. Uh, mm -hmm. um, coefficient. And you said that the delta, small delta plus the collective, uh, the tuning is, should be zero in order um, it, for this It should be, I mean, let me, let me just show you the, the picture here. So um, this delta collective plus the outside delta should be zero. So if we set the outside delta equal to zero, then this, this one is zero for this, for these two parameters, but we can, we can find other ones, right? So if you, for example, detune that by let's say, 0.5 gamma to the, to the red, 
your 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 um your reflectivity would happen somewhere at 0.27 or so and at something like 0.4 or something like that right yes so the, that those values that you got at 0.2 at 0 0.8 uh -huh. uh, were only valid uh, where where this small delta is equal to zero essentially yes, right exactly huh? okay okay great okay and then uh, maybe another question uh, that, that you didn't talk about, but I was curious because you you said at the beginning that one of the applications was about uh, was about atomic clocks. Yes. <laughs> so um, what actually? Let me let me just very briefly get. And I, I, as I told you, this is what we are doing is not by far as good as an as an atomic clock yet. Um, um, but but I saw that you were at some point. At, Towards yes. the end, you were talking, yeah, yeah, exactly. Were, so what what I showed you before was that these two interactions talk to each other. So what we can do is we it actually turns out that we have exceptional points here. If you know what that is, good. If you don't, um, forget about it. It's actually not so important to understand. So if we detune these two impurities a little bit of each other, then the the black lines that that we had. Um, are the ones that I showed you before where these two impurities exchange their population. If we yeah. detune them from each other a little bit, um, you get this orange and blue line. So as you see, they don't exchange their populations a little bit. Uh, they, they don't exchange the populations at all anymore. They just go a little bit in the direction. So you can basically take the maximum point of the previously unpopulated impurity as a kind of a quality. And so that one you can plot into a, into a diagram where you plot on the y-axis the height of this point here. And on the x-axis, um, the, 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 here this is the detuning of the two impurities from each other. And what you find is that, um, that these come depending on where, um, what your A over lambda is. Um, these um, change, these give line widths that are really of the order of, of something like um, 10 to the minus five or even smaller kind of times gamma, where gamma is the line width of the impurities. And please to note that the impurities work the better the narrower the line width is. So that means that basically what we do is that we improve the line widths, the natural line widths of the impurities by another like, let's say five or six orders of magnitude. So this is what this is about. And, and the, the fact that you were talking about exceptional points has to do with the, um, with the fact that you have some dissipation process. Yes, right? exactly. Because, so uh, the reason why this gets so bad is that you get this exceptional point type um, um, dissipation here. That's exactly right. So it's, it's just exceptional points happen to be super sensitive often. And this, this sensitivity often um, results in kind of effects like this here. We have done a lot of, of, of calculations to that. It's also not yet published. We are working on this. And this produces like pictures like that or so, which I um, don't want to go into. Okay. But may, may I ask, because we, we have a question, I will, uh, I will uh, read it uh, immediately. But I, since you are here about this, uh, uh, I guess this was the part in where you were talking about the two impurities inside the lattice, right? Uh -huh. And you said that, that you see an interaction between them. And, of, and one of the applications is the one that uh, you are describing in this lattice. Yeah. Um, yeah. My question is, what about if the impurities are mobile? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's actually, I mean, Typically, they are mobile, but they are um, they are mobile only basically um, within. Um, let me just uh, no, um, it doesn't matter. Um, um, within um, this kind of single, so they would not move okay. um, too much around here because they should really be on the on the. Um, 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 between sitting between the other atoms, but you can of course imagine uh, that they move around anywhere in the single cell here, right? Or potentially even have an initial kind of momentum and move through here or something like that. So okay. um, what that means is that we have to look at 
um, first of all, what happens if if this if this impurity doesn't sit quite in the middle? And some of these pretty pictures that I just flashed you um, um, are basically about that. Um, it also turns out that that um, it is good if you sit relatively on a high symmetry point here, which is perhaps yeah. not very surprising. What fortunately doesn't matter so much is whether the one whether the one atom sits here and the other sits here, or whether the one sits here and the other sits, let's say, here. Okay. So that one um, gives you pretty similar results. I so see. the exact places, uh. as long as you have them in the middle of the of the array, it still mm. changes, but it doesn't change very much. But if you moved it around, and for example, instead of having it here, you have it here directly next to the other, the, the results will change quite yeah. a bit. So that's so, an so, important mm -hmm. question to make sure that this sits at the right place. So, so, so the message may be that if I understood correctly, Suzanne, is that this interaction is a, a spin type, of course, but it's quite long range. So yes, it's quite long uh, range. And it really depends more of the because both of them mostly couple to the array around them and the array it, it doesn't kind of transport perfectly and not instantaneously, but pretty perfectly and pretty instantaneously. I see, I see. That's wow. that's that's the physics behind that, yes. Uh, we have a question by uh, Vinicius. Uh, you mentioned that there are numerical methods to address uh, uh, some of the problems that you were talking about. Yes. Uh, could you quote some of those? So this is actually really <laughs> very different for all of these. Um, in order to do these very simple ones um, that I showed in the beginning, where we assume an infinitely large array, etc., you can basically write that all down analytically. And the only thing that you have to do numerically is kind of solve the sum of all of all interactions of the interaction of every atom with every other. And this is a very kind of this is an infinite sum that's very easy um, analytically to write down and to get the numbers out of that. This is, I mean, Mathematica does that for you in a fraction of a second. Um, the others, um, everything else is actually quite a bit more um, um, sophisticated. It's, it's mostly done on a, on a similar level. So it's, 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 it's mostly kind of straightforward. We write down the equations where we treat these impurities, for example, as, um, as variables, everything about the impurities as a variable and the, and the, and the array that it couples to as a background. Um, but um, depending on whether you whether you are in the coordinates, whether you are interested in special coordinates like with this with this impurities, or more in the momentum space like with this momentum dark state, um, it does make sense to go either into into the um, um, coordinate or the momentum space. And honestly, there are a couple of pretty good papers. And if you want to know any more details, I would kind of um, Send you to some of the papers that I've um, that I've cited throughout, and I'm also happy if you have some some more specific question, um, perhaps to to just write me an email and I send you something about this. Um, there is um, for nothing of what I what I showed today. There is anything particularly tricky. There are a couple of tricky methods, but they are all applying to stuff that I did not talk about today. Okay, so another question by Arsenio. I think about again the impurity uh, problem. Hi, Suzanne, thanks for the seminar. In the application of two interacting impurities, can we observe some kind of condo effect even in non uh, emission systems? That is actually a very interesting question, I have to say. It, it is really a very interesting question, and we have not thought about this. And it's probably if you have a little bit more of a um, condensed matter background than I, then it's probably indeed the first question that you would think about. Honestly, I think this, what I just showed this kind of, um, su some of this kind of two impurity stuff probably goes into the direction of condo physics, but I cannot, um, my, my answer would be yes, somewhat. And it would be really, an, I mean, these systems are in their interest cases, they are all non-equilibrium non um, because we all need kind of excitons for it. And 
So it would be probably indeed some kind of non-equilibrium version of the Fondo effect. Um, this is a very good idea. So um, um, this, um, I, I think that that might be an interesting project to do. So um, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not stealing anybody's ideas. So, so work on it or contact me. We can perhaps talk about that. I need to think a little bit about that. But yeah, thank you. That's really an interesting direction. Okay, I don't know if we're eager. We have other questions. I have, I, question. you have one, Igor. Please go ahead. Uh, we see, we can see the the effect of uh, uh, clearly the effect of impurities on the on the spectrum problem. But uh, 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 well, uh, where we can see the the fingerprints of the geometry of the the light field on the results. Um, sorry. Um, so it, it, you 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 were I, it, you were how to hear. So let me try to repeat what you said to see whether I understood the right. So your question is: you see the effect of the impurity, but you would be interested. Where is the effect of the geometry of the lattice? Is that yes. correct? Yes, correct. Okay. So um, it turns out that this is actually also what 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 um, when we looked at the the effect of where the impurity sits, we also looked at other lattices. And as I told you before, this kind of reflection, um, this is um, it really as long as it's regular, it works. We even did it for, for a quasi crystal where we have kind of crystalline ordering on the near field and completely um, random ordering in the far field. And even there, it works not quite as perfect, but it still works pretty well. Um, where it becomes interesting is when when you really kind of look exactly at how how this this impurity sits in its nearest neighbor cell, and it turns out um, again the overall physics is actually in principle the same, but it turns out that the that in this case for the impurities for some reason the square lattice really works considerably, considerably better than if you go, let's say, to a triangular lattice or a, a honeycomb lattice. So this is really something which at the moment we are still kind of trying to figure out why that is actually the case, because this is not obvious. Um, what one would think is that all of them work similarly well, and this is actually not the case. But yes, we are looking into that, and now I can tell you exactly how this works here. Okay, thank you. So, Suzanne, maybe building on this question by, by Igor, as a curiosity, so where does the, the physics of uh, optical tweezers fit in these, uh, in these uh -huh. uh, applications? Because so, I, I guess so there- far, So far, not at all. Uh, Why? Yeah. Because while optical tweezers would be totally perfect to build an array like this, and we would have total freedom of how to do it. Right now, we really need this kind of this lattice constant of the order of the wavelengths. And the optical tweezers, they cannot do this yet. So you could imagine you do it with optical tweezers and then you go into a Rydberg state and you do a Rydberg to Rydberg transition, which is very long wavelengths. But the, the Rydberg state so far not quite, um, not quite stable enough that one would really try this experimentally. At the end, of course, that's exactly where we hope to go with this, that one can actually kind of find a way how to put this in tweezer arrays. And as I say, going into Rydberg is one way, um, doing some kind of um, effectively long wavelengths um, kind of Raman transition or so is another one. And this is definitely something where we, where we are talking about in particular with the experimentalists. Okay, so you're moving in that direction, but uh, at least for what you explained, uh, they don't fit. Uh, so far, well they don't into fit. The they, so far, they don't fit exactly. Okay, and we said we were talking about another physical system, the, the TMDs. Yeah. Uh, there, what are the typical distances? I'm not so quite that familiar is actually, with that. That's uh, that's a very good question. These are of course much, 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 much smaller. Okay, so they are. Um, of the order of, I mean, they have they have lattice constants a priori that are of the order of a couple of angstroms, right? Um, so they are kind of basically three orders or more than three orders of magnitude 
smaller than the, the wavelengths. As I showed you before, as long as A over lambda is between zero and one, this works. So this is why these TMD um, experiments actually gave result, the results. But the interesting physics actually is really where this happens, where these are of the same order. So here, the same question um, is, is basically as what you asked about the arrays, but in the opposite direction. So how can we actually get our exciton still regular, but further apart um, in order to get the really interesting results? And I mean, there are a couple of things that, that we have started looking into it. And, and actually right now we are not even because that's, that's um, all not so promising. But one, the, the most promising one is in going into the double layer system, going into this so-called Moray system, where you have two double layers, uh, two layers, which you turn just slightly against each other. And then you get patterns with a lattice constant that's considerably larger than the original lattice constant of the TMD. Um, that one is relatively promising theoretically because it, it, people have shown numerically that you actually indeed can pin excitons to, to certain points there, but this is still very far from, from doable in the, in, in the experiment case. And in addition, one actually gets excitons that are rather delocalized, which of course is not the case with atoms. So that's another question, which in principle we also work on is, what do we do if these atoms are not nicely localized at their point, but if all of them are delocalized of a couple of lattice sites? So whether this still works, my guess is yes, but we haven't proven it yet. So I can't really give you an answer. Okay, so the, 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 the final message maybe is that there is still a lot of work to do. Oh, there's the still system. a lot of work to be done. <laughs> And I have a pretty sizable group by now. And a lot of the people in the group work on various aspects on that. And some of them, a lot of them actually on aspects that I didn't even touch upon today. But yes, there is. The, this is not a system that runs out anytime soon, um, both because there's a lot to do. And second, because there's a lot of people who are getting now with their experimental, um, with their experimental apparatus somewhere in the region where you can actually do some of these experiments. And if you can do one of those experiments, you can probably do five, right? So people are actually very interested in trying that out. Okay, great, great. Okay, Suzanne, so I don't, I don't know, Igor, if there are any other questions. Uh, if not, uh, I would like to thank uh, Suzanne All for right, thank, the thank very nice so talk much. for, um, the, this for was... the final discussion. Uh, you can say, so, I... A little bit more Sorry, you in are the room completely if you want. breaking up I will now. now. <laughs> and thank all the participants. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so I thank all the participants and uh, give, uh, uh, and we will meet uh, next month for another uh, 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 colloquium of the uh, Brazilian Physical Law Thanks for to everyone. Okay.